Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming, taking your time out of your, your day to day to sit and, and listen to a lecture that I hope you find interesting. Um, thanks, ANF, for giving me the opportunity to come and speak on this topic. It's a topic I'm really passionate about. Um, the topic today, as the title says, is human rights advocacy at the UN. And so the discussion today will have focused mostly about how our advocacy approach is at the United Nations more so than substantive human rights issues. Um, we actually have written reports on these issues that go into detail about uh, the issues that we're covering. Um, and those reports are available here. If you guys want to maybe take a few copies or ha if you guys can pass it around, yeah. Um, I didn't print out that many. Uh, we usually post it on our website. Our website is down at the moment. Uh, we're redoing it, but um, I just printed out a few copies so you get an understanding of what we're trying to do um, and an understanding of the issues that we're focusing on. Today, I want to talk about um, four things, really, or uh, five things. Uh, what our principles are when we are doing advocacy work at the UN, kind of our mission statement or a vision statement. Um, our approach in our advocacy, it's more of a conceptual understanding of what we kind of are trying to do at the UN. Um, uh, an overview of the kind of select programs and activities we have done at the UN, so you can get a specific understanding of how we're applying these principles and how we're applying the approach. And then a, kind of a frank assessment of uh, what the impact of all of this is. I know a lot of people have asked me what the impact is. And so um, I hope to address those issues today. So our principles. Our principles are really three-pronged. Um, first off, it's rights-based. So what we're doing at the, at the UN is advocacy from a human rights perspective. And as I state here, we're pursuing solutions from a human rights perspective. We're not pursuing solutions from a humanitarian perspective. We're not pursuing solutions from a political perspective. We're looking at these human rights that are afforded um, to all people internationally and doing a frank assessment of the situation in the countries in which uh, Assyrians live and providing um, solutions within the context of human rights. And at the same time, we're uh, leveraging the obligations states have to advocate for reform in law and policy. So all states are obligated to ensure the, the human rights of the citizens that, that live in their country. And so we're using those obligations to advocate for reform. Secondly, our approach is very much youth-led. And this is something I'm extremely, extremely proud about because the people who are leading this initiative are all young professionals. And I'm actually doing a disservice right now standing here by myself because I am definitely not um, leading this cause alone. There are a lot of Assyrian youth um, that from actually throughout the US that are participating in this, working closely with me on these issues. And um, that's, again, one of the things I'm extremely proud about. And they're using their uh, professional background. A lot of them are law students, master's students, or recent graduates, putting into practice what they've learned professionally and serving their community. And it's really ensuring kind of a long-term commitment with these people who um, may not otherwise find a way to use what they have grown or what they have been educated in uh, to serve their community and now they have we're trying to give them that opportunity and we're seeing that they're really more emotionally invested in in helping out the community long term uh, thirdly our focus or one of our principles is coalition centered and which means that we're really wanting to work and coordinate with other organizations to really maximize our impact in what we're doing and this means working with organizations both in iraq outside of Iraq, Assyrian, and non-Assyrian organizations. And we really are starting to see ourselves as being a facilitator of information. Um, we are an American-based NGO. Uh, we are coming from a perspective of many of the people who were born in the US. So we feel more comfortable working closely with organizations that are dealing with the situation on the ground, grassroots organizations, and facilitating the work that they do and bringing it to the attention in the international arena and having um, a lot of the p key actors at the UN take notice of the great work that they do. So we're more and more seeing ourselves as facilitators in this arena. And we've worked closely with groups like the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization, which is an NGO based in Brussels um, that, serves the, uh, that serves stateless nations throughout the world. We've been working closely with them since the early 90s and more so now as we're really trying to leverage what the UN has to offer. Um, they've been able to work closely with other stateless nations, like, you know, similar to Assyrians, and we've learned a lot of positive practices um, 
successes that they've done, and we're trying to translate that um, to, for our own community here. Um, we've also worked very closely with Hammurabi Human Rights Organization. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that uh, group as being uh, the group that publishes the, the kind of uh, periodic reports of the situation in Iraq. Um, they're a very well-respected uh, human rights organization in Iraq that serves uh, not only the Assyrian community, but um, hum uh, all of Iraqis. They're well-respected in Iraq. They actually recently uh, was, were awarded a Human Rights Defenders Award by the U.S. State Department in 2012 uh, for their work um, defending human rights. And they're one of two organizations uh, that had done that, uh, that had received that award. We've also worked with the Ninva Center for Research and Development. It's another organization that's based in the Ninva Plain that provides a lot of really interesting statistics uh, and data about the situation um, in the Ninva Plain. So throughout my presentation, I'm going to focus uh, on these core principles, um, kind of show you how we're trying to integrate them in what we're doing. Uh, but next, I want to talk about our advocacy approach. Um, and actually, before I do, I'll go back to this picture, because this picture kind of epitomizes um, our principles. Here we have um, myself uh, standing to the far right is um, Mr. Luis um, uh, Marcos, who is the vice president of Hammurabi Human Rights Organization. And he's also a, a member of the District Council of Berdede, or Karakosh. We were able to fly him in um, from Iraq to Geneva to participate in this conference that I'll be speaking more about in my presentation. Um, next to me is Renya Hanna, who's also um, from Iraq, uh, who works with um, uh, uh, Mikhail Benjamin, who is in the, the green shirt over there, with the NIMBA Center for Research and Development. We were also bring, able to bring them from Dohuk to participate in this uh, UN forum in Geneva. And to the far right, we have um, George Stifo, the um, American representative from the Assyrian Democratic Organization. Our advocacy work, as I'll explain more, focuses not only on Iraq, but wherever Assyrians are indigenous to. And so we were able to facilitate his uh, participation as well. We also extended an invite to the other Assyrian uh, political party in, in Syria, a Syrian a patriotic party, right? Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to attend, but... And in the middle, we have another Assyrian youth, Jennifer Babayi, who's studying international law in D.C., who was able to uh, help facilitate um, and uh, participate in that conference. So this picture very much epitomizes these core principles that were kind of the focus of what we're trying to do uh, at the U.N. Um, our approach in terms of our advocacy is two-pronged. Um, the first prong is global and thematic, meaning that we do advocacy um, in, on issues that are looked at internationally, not just within a specific country. We want to participate in the dialogue on issues that concern um, Assyrians. So these issues that we've identified include indigenous rights and minority rights, uh, religious freedom, uh, and the rights of the displaced. Um, we also tackle a lot of other uh, relevant uh, concerns, including uh, discrimination faced by women, um, the situation of uh, children, economic, social, and cultural rights, and political rights as well, but always within the context of, of these three issues that we uh, adamantly pursue in our advocacy work. Because um, we've kind of identified these three issues as being um, the kind of frameworks in which Assyrian rights are most infringed. Um, we also attend several conferences in which these issues or these human rights themes are pursued. Uh, including the Forum on Minority Issues, uh, Indigenous Issues, and consultation with uh, the UNHCR, which is the UN's refugee agency. And I'll speak more about um, our participation uh, in these UN conferences in, uh, in later in my presentation. But our goals when we're trying to participate, when we're working uh, at, at the UN, um, include uh, influencing the development of human rights norms and principles. So what that means is every time one of these conferences take place, at the end of it, there's some sort of document that comes out, a report, a list of suggestions, uh, a list of recommendations. And these recommendations and suggestions um, influence the ways in which uh, countries are working to defend and promote human rights. And we're eager there to make sure that whatever recommendations come out and what kind of, kind of solutions that are put forth take into consideration the issues faced by Assyrians um, in the Middle East. And that's one of, one of our key aims in participating <coughs> in these conferences. And I hope to have illustrate that better um, later on in my presentation. The second is that we definitely are trying to raise the profile of issues concerning Assyrians at these conferences. We've noticed there's a huge dearth of information and knowledge about the situation 
of minorities in, the, in these countries, uh, let alone Assyrians. So we find it uh, extremely important that when we're there, uh, we provide the knowledge that uh, a lot of these uh, kind of UN experts are eager to learn about when uh, discussing issues um, uh, concerning human rights. Uh, and lastly, these forums have served as a great opportunity for us to network with other uh, like state delegates who want to learn more information about what, what the situation of Assyrians are, um, from UN officials who may be working in countries where Assyrians uh, inhabit in the Middle East and have been serving Assyrian communities, um, and other international organizations like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch that are regularly participating in these conferences and regularly writing about the situation of Assyrians. And so we're there trying to network with them and influence sort of the discussions that are, are the, the work that they're doing as well. The second approach um, in our advocacy is country specific. So what we're trying to do is look at the human rights situation of Assyrians within a specific country rather than talk about issues uh, concerning Assyrians internationally. Uh, and the countries that we're looking at are the countries in which Assyrians are indigenous to, including Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Uh, obviously, with the situation in Iraq, that's given most of our attention. Um, but we have worked, and we will continue to work on uh, human rights issues in all three countries. Um, and by virtue of being a, a member state of the United Nations, these countries and all 193 uh, member states are subject to periodic reporting of their human rights record. And um, at the, at, during these reporting cycles, uh, organizations like AUA, like Human Rights Watch, have the opportunity to influence the discussion by submitting reports and by uh, providing statements. Um, and I'll speak about more about that later on in my presentation as well. Um, these reporting cycles are uh, kind of, there's two ways of doing it. One is through treaty bodies which is uh, led through independent experts. These are attorneys, these are judges, these are people who are experts in their field of human rights that are elected to monitor the human rights record of all 193 uh, member states of the United Nations um, with the aim of providing kind of constructive feedback on how they can better uphold their obligations. This process is an independent process. It's not influenced by the, the politics of, of uh, the member states. But on the other hand, we have the Universal Periodic Review, which is another mechanism in the UN that also does uh, periodic reporting of, of the member states of the UN. But it is a political process because it's led by the Human Rights Council, which is made up of 47 member states, um, which is made up of 40 mem 47 member states. And they uh, also lead a similar kind of review uh, as the treaty bodies, but it is, again, a political mechanism. So these are states that are uh, driving the dialogue. And our goal in participating in these is, again, to ensure that the issues affecting Assy Assyrians are um, raised and accurately discussed. So when their uh, state delegate participates, let's say, from Iraq on one of these reporting cycles and makes a factually uh, inaccurate statement about the situation of minorities or the situation specifically of Assyrians have been addressed. Um, and we do that through the reportings that were passed around. Um, we also advocate for the adoption of relevant recommendations. So after the end of these sort of rec uh, reporting cycles, these committees issue recommendations on how the state can better uphold its obligations. And so we try to craft recommendations that are reflective of the interest of Assyrians um, in that country. Lastly, um, we network again. These are always great networking opportunities to engage with all these different stakeholders, all these different actors who are working on these issues. And, um, kind of see how we can coordinate our efforts uh, going forward. Um, let's see this picture. So now I want to talk to you about uh, the few of the select programs and activities we've been doing at the United Nations um, for the past three or four years um, to give you an understanding of how we're applying our principles, how we're applying our approach. Um, so going back to our global and thematic advocacy, uh, we've participated at the Forum on Minority Issues, where we've delivered statements on Assyrians, uh, including uh, the, the rights of women, right to economic and political participation, freedom of religion. And we've had the statements that we've been delivered influence those development of those human rights norms that I spoke about earlier. Um, We've, we've done these, we've participated at the forum for over four years now. It's an annual forum. It's a two-day session. And as I mentioned last year, we were able to actually bring voices from the Middle East who have been um, very kind of a leaders in their community 
to, uh, on human rights issues and having them participate in these, in these forums um, and bring attention. It's one thing if um, a, a few American um, law students go, go to the UN and speak on this issue. It's a completely other matter when you get people who have witnessed the persecution or have endured it firsthand to speak on the, it, to speak on the issue. So we're eager to continue facilitating that kind of participation um, as it's been very fruitful going uh, in, in this work. Um, and we've also organized advocacy meetings with different UN agencies that serve our community uh, in the Middle East. And the picture we have here is, again, um, of the members from uh, Iraq who came to the forum last year with Jennifer at the UNHCR. And uh, we have a picture here with the deputy uh, director of UNHCR's operations in the Middle East and North Africa. They had a very frank conversation about how UNHCR uh, serves the Assyrian community there and opportunities to um, kind of better coordinate or, or better serve the community. And we also work with the, uh, we've also participated at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and we've done it alongside Assyrian Aid Society, which has done it for about three years now. Um, and one of the challenges there is that, um, and one of the things that we realize when participating at these forums is the importance of really uh, raising the issue of what's happening to Assyrians because right now at that forum there isn't a sort of space for which Middle Eastern organizations to raise attention about, um, uh, about their community th uh, within the indigenous rights framework. And what that means is that um, the, the permanent forum is organized sort of regionally and we, uh, there's representation from South America, there's representation from Australia, Africa, even Europe, uh, East Asia, but there's no representation for the Middle East. And so we're there trying to kind of lead the issue and kind of raise awareness that, yes, there are indigenous people in the Middle East. Um, their, issue, their issues uh, fall within the concerns of this permanent forum. And the structure of this forum should be modified to, to take into consideration these issues. A country-specific approach, um, we've participated in the treaty bodies, um, which specifically we just participated in the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Some of you may have been familiar with them. They're the ones that issued the recommendation for the safe haven um, with uh, UN peacekeeping forces. Um, prior to uh, attending the session, we submitted a report um, about a month early. It was right in the middle in which the uh, so-called Islamic State had uh, taken over Mosul and mo uh, parts of the Nimba Plain. Um, so most of our report doesn't touch upon that issue. We tried to include some aspects of it. We did, however, participate in um, we also provided an oral statement where we addressed a lot of the more recent concerns. Um, and we offered the, the recommendation of the safe haven there. Um, we've participated also in the Universal Periodic Review of Iraq. Again, this is the more political mechanism that's run by the Human Rights Council. And again, we submitted a, a full length report. And the session is actually going to take place next month. And we're going to be organizing a half day conference before the session takes place specifically on Assyrian issues. This is going to be in Geneva. Um, so that the member states, the 47 countries that are part of the Human Rights Council, are aware of the situation um, facing Assyrians, are aware of our recommendations, and are able to um, take that into consideration during the review. And again, to highlight the fact that although right now the issue of Iraq is very pressing, we've been working on human rights issues throughout the Middle East. Um, and so we've also, we've also wrote a report for Turkey's um, Universal Periodic Review, which is going to take place uh, next year. Um, we've done that in conjunction with Assyrian organizations based in Turkey, um, somewhat anonymously, because ironically enough, even, uh, even though Turkey is considered to be a democracy, it has one of the highest rates of uh, jailed journalists and human rights defenders. So the sort of persecution and discrimination faced there is more sanctioned, state sanctioned. And so we were careful in obtaining information and not trying to make it a liability for the people who live in that country. Um, next issue. So our success, uh, and within the, fr uh, the three principles that I had introduced earlier in the presentation, um, include, uh, our, the, include the fact that we had submitted over a dozen statements to UN bodies and various human rights issues concerning Assyrians from Turkey to um, Iraq and Syria. And most recently, uh, we're very proud to announce that the recommendations that we had proposed um, at the treaty body session of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination was adopted. And that was the recommendation to establish a safe zone for the return of displaced people from the Nimba Plain uh, with the help of UN peacekeepers. 
Um, more so, than more recommendations came out after that, and um, one of them included um, equal representations of Assyrians in security forces in the Nineveh Plain, which is also another very pressing concern um, that we're, uh, a lot of people are, are, a lot of organizations are pursuing. From the youth-led principle, um, we have six Assyrian young professionals that, have, that are working on this as a core group of kids who are dedicating what they know. Um, they're experts from um, uh, counterterrorism and security studies that are kind of really illustrating, or educating me at least, about uh, the, the security issues with respect to the human rights implications. Um, and they, by virtue of having the professional background and applying it to the situation of Assyrians, They've slowly, in my opinion, are developing to become really experts on um, Assyrians and human rights issues. And they're becoming very well versed on these topics and um, confident to say that they'll be kind of using their knowledge going forward. Uh, with respect to their coalitions, um, we have 10 Assyrian and non-Assyrian organizational partners that we work with regularly when we participate in these UN conferences. And um, we facilitate their participation at the UN with respect to these Iraqi organizations, and we, we incorporate their recommendations or their, their, their research and writing in Iraq within the, the written statements that we submit to the UN. But what does this all mean? And um, well, how does it have an impact at the end of the day? So there are opportunities to influence change um, through these UN advocacy methods. Most importantly, it legitimizes our recommendations and our policy solutions. When we have an independent body comprised of 18 experts from around the world unequivocally saying that a safe haven needs to be established, that is legitimacy. That definitely bolsters our claim. It makes it apolitical. It makes it something that is human rights focused. And, it, and I'm sure it's going to make it easier when you translate that to advocacy in DC and all these other political centers. Um, and it mostly uh, mo also ele elevates the profile of Assyrians internationally um, and among po influential policymakers, NGOs, and the media. Um, I can say um, without equivocation that a lot of the actors at the UN have no idea what the situation of Assyrians are. When we were at the UN in Geneva last week, we uh, had to actually educate that Iraqi Christians are an ethnic minority as well. They speak a different language. These are judges, these are lawyers, these are people who are um, very, you know, very professional and established individuals, but they just have to deal with so much information that it's not expected for them to know everything about everyone, and that's why we're there. Um, and so, um, again, by being participating in these conferences and participating in these mechanisms, we're able to kind of raise issues and, and bring certain attention to light. But there are limitations. Uh, people have been very critical of the UN, and rightly so. It's very slow-paced and very bureaucratic. Um, you can kind of get that sense by just the way I've been describing the mechanisms. It's extremely, extremely bureaucratic. Um, and it's extremely slow-paced. These human rights reporting cycles happen from two to six years in between. Um, we were extremely fortunate that the um, Iraq's reporting cycle took place in August, you know, just a few weeks after what had happened by the Islamic State. But um, otherwise, you know, the opportunities to engage in that dialogue may be so far removed from a certain situation or a certain atrocity um, in which we can't really utilize these platforms effectively. Um, and although we can have these experts uh, recommending the establishment of a safe haven, and although their voices um, weigh heavy, uh, Action, at the end of the day, depends on the political will of the member states. The UN is nothing more than 193 states coming together. So if you want to see the 193, if you want to see the UN do something, you have to figure out how you can get the political will to translate the recommendations into action. And I'm very proud that a lot of um, kind of the advocacy that we're doing is furthering that political will, is pulling pressure on these actors to, to take into consideration a lot of the recommendations that were being put forth. And more recently, there's kind of a new development that a lot of the action that does take place takes place through consensus. Um, and it's really hard to build consensus with political bodies. And so when there is a resolution put forth, it's usually um, a resolution that all of the members of a certain body can agree upon. That always dilutes it. That always makes it weak. Where uh, we don't have the luxury of well, having a resolution that only those that are sympathetic to our cause adopt. Um, we're kind of at the leisure of everyone who sits on whatever body uh, is 
mandated to, to take action, whether it's the Security Council or the Human Rights Council. Um, so that's a, a, a little bit of an overview of what, what the impact of all of this is, and um, I just want to leave it open for questions and answers.